good afternoon and good evening, dear vascular surgeons, angiologists, and radiologists all over the universe. I am honored to welcome all of you for uh, our 12th webinar meeting. Today, we have to meet the fellows. I am honored to celebrate today the memory of great vascular scientist, Professor Adel Elham. Professor Adel was one of the cornerstones of vascular surgery in Egypt. And I am honored to announce the seventh version for Adel Elham International Award for Vascular Fellows. <clears throat> Let me first uh, introduce my co-moderator, Professor Omar Farouk. Hello, Omar. Hello, Professor Ayman. And uh, I am honored to thank our great scientific committee that have the time and uh, the effort to uh, take over and uh, the viewing and the abstracts and choose this great competitors today. Uh, I would like to thank Professor Pierre Luigi Antoniani, Professor of Angiology from Italy, Professor Victor Canetta, Professor of Vascular Surgery from Paraguay, Professor Raul Jindel, Senior Vascular Surgery from Mohali, India, and uh, Professor Tariq Abdul Azim, Professor of Vascular Surgery in Shams University. Thank you all for your great efforts to select our great competitor today. And now I'm honored to introduce the great judges today. Welcome, Professor Monir Nazal from Professor of Surgery, Toledo University, Professor of Surgery and Chief of Vascular and Endovascular uh, Division, Toledo University, Professor Ahmed Korsat Buzgart, Professor of Cardiovascular Surgery, Istanbul University, and President of Turkish Society of Vascular Surgery, Professor Mark Whitley, uh, Professor of General Surgery and Director of Whitley Clinic, London, United Kingdom, Professor Samar Kosayer, Senior Consultant of Vascular Surgery and Head of Vascular, surgery, vascular and Endovascular Division at King's Faisal Specialized Cent Hospital and Research Center, Professor Martin Murch, Professor of Vascular Surgery, Senior Professor of Vascular Surgery and Head of Division of BDF Hospital in Bahrain. Uh, and honored to introduce the director of the uh, competition, Professor Adel Murad, uh, Ali Murad. Professor Ali is Senior Vascular Surgery and uh, the biggest man in Egyptian Military Academy of Vascular Surgery. And uh, we all considered him as our angel for vascular surgery in Egypt. Now I'm honored to give the mic to Professor Omar Farou to start the competition. Please, Omar. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Ayman. Uh, good luck to the six candidates. Uh, the rule is there is eight minutes for each candidate to present his work, and I will give one minute warning for he finish in order to go rapidly to the conclusion. 
let me introduce the first candidate, uh, Professor Denis Borsk. He is a famous vascular surgeon from Russia. He works in the clinic of philippology and laser surgery, a very eminent, publishing a lot of paper about venous work. Good luck, Dr. Dennis. Screen. So, thank you. Do, do you hear me? Everything working well? Yeah, yes, yeah, working very well. Okay, uh, so my presentation, thank you for this opportunity, and uh, my presentation will be about randomized comparative trial comparing free energy settings in endovenous laser ablation for chronic venous disease. I have nothing to disclosure, and as you know that uh, today endovenous thermal methods are considered as the gold standard of treatment of varicose veins in all uh, clinical practice guidelines. And, you know, having said about lasers, we need to think about uh, energy settings. And as this uh, very interesting paper showed us that in water specific lasers, we can use linear and the venous energy density from 60 to 85 uh, joules per centimeter. Uh, and our first step was uh, to compare uh, morphological analysis of the veins after uh, endovenous lasers in free energy settings. We had 10 patients in each group and we used uh, the same linear endovenous energy density approximately 70 joule per centimeter. Uh, but in first group we used 5 watts, uh, in second 7 watts and in 10, and, uh, 10 watts in third group in the third group. Of course, you can think that uh, we have another uh, energy on the top of the fiber, it's true. But in all of the groups, we had uh, just ab about uh, 0.5 watt uh, less at the top of the fiber. And it was comparable and all uh, this uh, uh, de decreasing was comparable in all of these uh, three groups. So, and what have we got uh, as a result? So, uh, we had 25% uh, of venous wall damage in the first group in 5 watt, 37% uh, of venous wall damage in 7 watt, and 55% of uh, venous wall damage in 10 watt group. So, it was the biggest in 10 watt and the smallest at the 5 watt group. As, as I said, the linear and the venous energy density was the same. It was a huge uh, statistical difference in all of these three groups. And when we uh, look in um, uh, microscope, of course, it could be some subjectivism there. But as I told you, uh, we had a very big uh, statistical difference in all of these three groups. So, uh, of course, we understood that it was a big uh, difference and the biggest uh, one, uh, biggest damage was in a 10 watt group. That is why we started our second part, uh, clinical trial, uh, where we compared uh, most important endpoints for us and for patients, uh, such as uh, procedural pain after, uh, pain after procedure uh, and also recanalization rate. It was prospective comparative randomized study, uh, 154 uh, endovenous lasers uh, for GSV, great sinus veins, uh, was included. Uh, we used radial fibers, uh, 14, 17 nanometers uh, wavelengths, automatic pullback traction, and patients were divided into three groups with the same uh, energy settings. Uh, uh, um, study was registered, investigation, this investigation was uh, registered in uh, clinical trials, and we used our Venus registry, uh, which cannot, uh, uh, which, uh, so you cannot cheat with results, okay, because you, uh, uh, use this online system for, you know, for patients. So our uh, endpoints was uh, pain score at the pain syndrome at one, seven and, uh, days and two months and also using of painkillers. And of course, we measured uh, recanalization rate in six months follow up. The main exclusion criteria was great saphenous vein, diameter of great saphenous vein more than two centimeters. Okay, it was the most important exclusion criteria. We used the same energy settings as I told you, and it was approximately 50 patients in each group. We used five watts, seven watts, 10 watts, 
uh, different pullback traction speed. And uh, as I told you, uh, and the Venus energy density was approximately 70 joule per centimeter. There was no any deep statistical difference uh, between groups in BMI, age, uh, length of ablated vein, uh, median diameter approximately to the junction uh, and uh, in the middle thigh, uh, amount of anesthetic and the uh, C classification. Here is the follow up, one day, seven day, two months and six months. And the result was, uh, so we didn't find any statistical difference on the first, uh, second uh, uh, post-operative day between all of the groups. The median of pain syndrome was zero in the first group, zero in the second group, and 0 0.5 in the third group. But as, as you can obviously see here, no statistical difference. The same in one week, in two months, uh, no difference between uh, painkillers, administration of painkillers, and we didn't find any recognition on all of these three groups in these 154 uh, cases. And I want to tell you as a discussion, then of course we had a difference in uh, simple morphologic an analysis, <clears throat> but we didn't know what is going on here in the, that part, which was not damaged with the simple morphology analysis. And as uh, Mark Whiteley showed us with his uh, fantastic uh, work with immune histochemistry, that we can find there different uh, molecules of adhesion, of inflammatory reactions, of apoptotic reactions. And we also don't know what can we find with uh, electronic microscopy, for example, you know. So that is why we cannot organize ideal morphological investigation, because we need to measure all of these molecules and substances in different time periods, because damage close to the fiber can be a reason of output of biological active substances and starting of inflammation or apoptosis. So, and uh, as a discussion, why do we, did we have so much, uh, so many uh, recanalization with uh, F laser, with Bayer fibers or sclerotherapy? And why we don't have it with radiofrequency closure fast or radial fibers? Why we, do we have approximately 100% of uh, occlusion rate? One minute here, remaining. Okay, here is uh, uh, an idea that in sclerotherapy we damaged only one world more, you know, and uh, with biofibers the same. But with radial fibers, we have uh, complete wall damage and it's not much important for 25% or for 100% because we have a lot of output of biological active substances, okay? Here is the conclusion. So endovenous lasers in different power, point, uh, power settings with the same lead is not presenting significant difference in terms of pain and recanalization, despite of previous demonstrated difference in venous wall damage. And as the second, that today we have different tools in market two ring radial fibers, tomorrow, then tomorrow we will have five ring radial fibers, you know, different methods, different wavelengths, but the methods are reach their peak. We cannot find better uh, pain syndrome, less pain syndrome, we can find uh, highest occlusion rate. That is the main conclusion of our study. And uh, we prefer about seven watt, it, but it's only our experience, nothing else. It's just our preferences. That's it. And uh, of course, I want to invite you to our Russian Egyptian Venus Forum, which will be held on uh, 8th of July. So all of you guys invited there. So I hope to see you there. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. Very good presentation. And thank you for respecting the time. The second challenger is from very dear country, Kazakhstan. His name is Dr. Shinalev Azad. He is a uh, he works in the National Research Oncology Center in the city of Nur Sultan, which is the capital of Kazakhstan. He is a vascular surgeon and intervention radiologist and also a phlebologist. Welcome on board. Good luck in your eight minutes, and I will give you one minute warning before you finish. Thank you very much, Dr. Omar. Good evening, dear colleagues. Uh, Allow me to submit the following report to you. <clears throat> the results of endovenous laser ablation in large varicose transformations of this way. And first, uh, many thanks to the organizing committee and everyone who takes part in this for opportunity to compete for the prize. And I wish success to my competitors. Uh, <clears throat> 
The urgency of the problem of varicose disease is associated not only with its prevalence and diversity of forms, but also with the fact that exciting treatment methods, they do not guarantee 100% uh, cure of absolutely all patients. The widely used treatment option for low limb varicose veins and telangiectasy in Kazakhstan are uh, compression therapy, pharmacological therapy, uh, cross-sectomy, stripping, uh, endovenous thermal ablation, uh, um, radiofrequency ablation, and foam layer therapy. Yes, of course, we use international concerns to see up. Uh, all patients before hospitalization we examinate at the outpatient level. Uh, <clears throat> uh, from February uh, 2015 to December 2019 in a private clinic in Nusultan, Kazakhstan, uh, 1430 13 endovenous laser ablation patient with large varicose transformation uh, suffering vein. <clears throat> All operations were carried uh, out on a dead laser with a wavelength of uh, 1470. Uh, patients were disturbed by gender and age. The uh, concomitant was also taken into a pathology. The distribution by gender is constant with wolf literature with significant um, predominance of women. You can see in the uh, slides. Um, <clears throat> all examined patients had a history of a number of concomitant disease which is associated with age of patient and the nature of uh, underlying disease. After encountered concomitant pathologies, it's hypertension which uh, was detected in uh, 74 patients, which accounts for 20%. And uh, uh, certain percent diabetes, uh, mellitus uh, 2.5, chronic heart disease 2%, percent atherosclerosis uh, was 1.06%. Um, percent. Uh, <clears throat> before surgery, all uh, patient underwent ultrasound duplex scanning queens and arteries of the lower extremities, uh, on the basis of which the patients were selected for endonatal laser ablation. After careful preparation of patients and with their writing concept for surgery, Evola was performed on patients with a laser with a wavelength of <coughs> uh, 1470. Uh, you can see what uh, was before. And what we have now, we have a good laser machine. Uh, it's a little bit uh, case before and after very young uh, patient uh, results. Within uh, 48 months, as a result of dynamic monitoring of patients using uh, all patient service observation in a condition of a private center, Mm, and phone surveys. Uh, on the first day after endovenous laser ablation, 69.5% uh, patients reported minor a painful sensation along the large suffering swing and together with an injection for common scent and CG. During surgery, the following reaction we noted in a number of patients. Sinus, uh, 1.2%, yes, sensation of heart disease, okay, 1.06%, uh, drop in blood pressure within 5.7%, uh, <clears throat> defect to laser pro <clears throat> skin pigmentation to uh, patients. Conclusion, as used to date, endonus laser ablation is the most effective and less traumatic method of treatment for the varicose transformation uh, of the gaze of endospain, which is confirmed by our immediate and long-term results of operation in patients with this disease. The presence <clears throat> in the clinic of the laser apparatus significantly affects the duration of the patient's stay in the hospital. And thank you for your attention. I hope you stay at Thank you very much, Dr. Shinalev, for your uh, 
uh, presentation and to respect to, to time. And to go to the third challenger, he is Dr. Kareem Issanhouri. He is an assistant consultant of vascular surgery in King Saud Medical City, Riyadh. Best of luck. And uh, timing will start when you get your speaking on your first slide. Good luck, Kareem. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you very much. My name is Karim Sanhuri. I am a vascular surgeon working in Saudi Arabia, honored to participate in this great event. I want to share a case of a young lady who presented to our hospital with acute limb ischemia and stroke secondary to COVID-19. Actually, since the beginning of 2020, the world has faced a pandemic that has challenged all the healthcare systems. And as vascular surgeons, we had uh, to deal with these patients and we have seen clinical syndromes that we have not been that have not been seen before. Uh, therefore, there's a lot of learning that's going on on this topic. I want to share with you a case that I hope uh, it will lead to discussion that could be helpful to everybody. So uh, there's a previously healthy 38 year old lady presented to our emergency department complaining of severe pain in the right arm of eight hours duration. She was confused with a glaucoma score of 12. Her right hand was cold, dusky, with absent pulses. There was moderate neurosensory deficit in the right arm, and a diagnosis of acute limb ischemia of rather for grade 2b was made. Her visual COVID-19 score was 4, which is equivocal, but a swab was taken that came back positive later. Her lab investigations here as seen, she has abnormal hematological characters, uh, including the ESR, CRP, LDH, D-dimers, fibrinogen. We also identified that she, she could have an undiagnosed diabetes mellitus as her hemoglobin A1C was 11. The CT and geography confirmed multiple filling defects in the aortic arch, the precious phallic trunk, in the right subclavian artery, and in the descending thoracic aorta. Also, unfortunately, on the CT of her brain, uh, it confirmed that there is a large right cerebellar infarction with collapsed fourth ventricle. Uh, the patient was sent on the emergency setting for right upper limb thromboembolectomy through the right brachial artery, yielding a significant amount of clots, as you see. Also, a volar forearm fasciotomy was done. Following the embolectomy, our colleagues from the neurosurgery department performed a decompressive occipital craniotomy to relieve the intracranial pressure. Postoperatively, distal pulse were restored with a pink hand, and she was commenced on aspirin statin. But unfortunately, we couldn't start her on a therapeutic dose of anticoagulation for fear of hemorrhagic conversion of the large cerebral infarction. So she was started on a prophylactic dose of low molecular weight heparin. But unfortunately, 12 hours later, she once again developed acute right upper limb ischemia, necessitating emergency return to the operating room for repeat thromboembolectomy. Then she was subsequently anticoagulated at a therapeutic dose of unfractionated heparin infusion. The patient enjoyed uneven for recovery after four days where she, she was extubated. Eventually, she was discharged home on day 15 with a glaucoma score of 14 and a well-perfused hand and intact pulsations. So this was only the first case. Since then, we have seen five or six cases with arterial thrombosis with arterial thrombosis complications over the uh, past few weeks. And these are photos for some patients with arterial thrombosis and subsequent gangrene in the ICU due to delayed presentation. So this is something which is not rare. It's something that the vascular surgeons all over the world could come across and see more and more daily during the pandemic. So the Italians have reported a series of 20 patients who developed acute limb ischemia with COVID-19 uh, over a period of three months. The youngest of them was 62, but no one has reported a young case like ours with this catastrophic complication. Also, ischemic strokes have been reported with COVID-19. Our colleagues in New York have reported five cases of large vessel stroke in patients all younger than the age of 50. And also in China, they reported that, that there is 5% incidence of stroke 
among hospitalized patients with COVID-19. So how does SARS-CoV-2 cause the arterial thrombosis? Some theories relate that to the endotheliitis. And there's a very elegant paper from The Lancet, and it showed that the SARS-CoV-2 infects the host using the S2 receptors. The S2 receptors are expressed in many organs, and it's widely expressed in the endothelial cells. In this paper, in the post-mortem analysis, it showed prominent endotheliitis of the submucosal blood vessels, along with apoptotic bodies. And this gives us an evidence of direct viral infection of the endothelial cells and diffuse endothelial inflammation. So this is also a recent paper uh, showing a patient that was COVID-19. The interesting thing is there was shortening levels of the von Welbarin factor and factor eight. And this points toward that there is massive endothelial stimulation and damage with the release of these factors. So consideration is given to how to improve the endothelial integrity. And this paper shows that statin therapy could improve the endothelial function and the endothelial integrity in two ways, either by uh, its immunomodulatory effect or by preventing the, con the cardiovascular damage. So to summarize that, the presence of hypercoagulable state in patients with COVID-19 is well documented. And uh, there are some important points we have to take care about. First of all, as vascular surgeons, we can receive a patient with acute thromboembolic event as a first presentation of SARS-CoV-2. And this patient could be a young patient, healthy one with no any other comorbidity. So we should have a high level of suspicion regarding these patients so we can improve their outcomes and at the same time, we can protect our staff. Also, anticoagulation is very important in patients with COVID-19, and it has to be considered for all either infected or suspect patients. Regarding the statins, the statins could be a very beneficial adjunct therapy in the management of COVID-19, improving the endothelial integrity. So uh, regarding the antiplatelets, so the rule of antiplatelets, although seems reasonable, but it's still uh, to be decided. So thank you very much for giving me this chance to present this case, and I hope you found it informative. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Karim. That was great. And thank you for sharing uh, such a difficult case management with us. Let me present uh, the fourth contender. He is uh, Dr. Lov Lothra. He is a vascular fellow from Department of Vascular and Endovascular Surgery, Fortis Hospital, Mihal, Punjab, India. Best of luck. And timer will start when you start speaking on your first slide. Good luck. I'm just uploading my presentation, sir. Okay. How long time would you take to, to be ready? Uh, just one minute, sir. Shall I take the next contender while you get ready? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please. Okay. Uh, there's some so, issue. Okay. So I will present the fifth contender, Dr. Suhail Ayman Najib. He's a vascular surgeon and specialist. He works in the insurance hospital in Alexandria and Egypt. He's a previous winner of Dr. Adil Ilhami Prize of MAC 2018 Prize in Munich Vascular Conference. Best of luck, uh, Dr. Suhail, and timer will start on you speak on the first slide. Good luck. You can unmute yourself. Unmute yourself, Dr. Suhail. Yes. Yes, and start the slide sharing. Can you, can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can hear you clear and we can see the slide. Good luck. Perfect, thank you. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be with you today, uh, talking about the endovenous ablation of anterior accessory vein reflux. I have no disclosures. Incompetence at the saphenofemoral junction is the most common cause of varicose veins, denoting about 70% of the problem. 
In some patients, reflux may occur from the anterior accessory vein rather than the great saphenous vein. In our study, we aim to compare laser crossectomy, the ablation at zero centimeter at the saphenofemoral junction, exactly at the level of the origin of the superficial external epigastric vein, versus direct anterior accessory vein ablation with 1470 radial double rings and do YAG laser with ambulant amount of tumescent anesthesia in the management of refluxing anterior accessory vein. In our study, we had 40 patients admitted to Al-Ambria and Alexandria Military Hospital with evidence of venous reflux of anterior accessory vein from February 1st, 2017 to January 30th, 2018. We divided them into two groups. The first group was treated by the ablation of the great saphenous vein at the saphenofemoral junction, 0 level, and the other group was treated by direct ablation of the anterior accessory vein. In our study, all patients had clinical assessment, good duplex evaluation, and divided randomly into two groups. First the group, a crossectomy group with ablation at zero centimeters, and the other group, direct anterior accessory vein ablation. All of our patients had follow-up one day, three months, and one year post-operatively. As you see in the figure, the, the laser fiber at zero centimeters. This is our team and great honor to show our results. We had a demography with age averaging 35.6 in group A and 34.3 in group B with male to female ratio six to 14 in group A and eight to 12 in group B. We had left side dominance in both groups with about 18 to 17 patients, either separately or um, bilaterally, with clinical presentation mostly at C3 or C4 stage in both groups. We had preoperative duplex assessment with vein diameter of about four to 12 millimeters in great saphenous vein and about three to nine millimeters in anterior accessory vein and it was almost equal in the both groups. Regarding the reflux, we had about 70 to 75% uh, of anterior accessory vein and great saphenous vein reflux in both groups. As you see in the figure, as the anterior accessory and the great saphenous vein, both are dilated. Regarding our procedure, we succeeded to reach saphenofemoral junction in all patients in group A showed absent reflux post-operatively, while we failed to pass and reach the saphenofemoral junction in three patients, denoting about 15% of the patients in the other group, and we, the rest of the segment was surgically removed. Post-operative assessment regarding the reflux, we had absent reflux in anterior accessory vein in both groups in the three months follow-up, while one patient in group A and two patients in group B showed reflux after one year. Regarding our complication, we had one patient of DVT in the crossectomy group, denoting about 5%, and one patient of superficial thrombophlebitis in each group, denoting 5% in each group. So to conclude, Mr. Chairman, dear professors and colleagues, after perfect duplex examination, laser crossectomy ablation could be a safe procedure in treating refluxing anterior accessory vein when using proper laser fiber type and enough amount of tumescent anesthesia. Before I finish my presentation, I'd like to thank all my team uh, and the nursing staff that help us very much and great thanks for the mentor and great professor, Professor Dr. Ayman Fakhri for being a great mentor for us for all of the Egyptian fellows. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks very much. And uh, by chance, is also your father. So uh, thanking him is very nice. So uh, are you ready, uh, my dearest uh, Dr. Love Lothra? Are you ready? Yes, sir. I'm ready. I'm ready, sir. You're ready. Okay. Best of luck. Timer will start when you speak on your first slide. Good luck. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Love Lutra from India. Uh, first of all, I hope everyone is safe and healthy. Wishes from India and my department. 
today I'll be presenting my study that is hyperhomocysteinemia, whether it is a risk factor or predictor of severity of primary chronic venous disease. Homocysteine, non-proteogenic alpha amino acid. It is formed by a methionine homocysteine cycle. The two basic processes involved in formation of homocysteine from methionine involves remethylation and desulfuration. The important cofactors that are responsible are vitamin B12 and folate, and both the deficiencies can lead to <coughs> decrease in the level of homocysteines or their hyperactivity can lead to increase in levels of homocysteines. Normal values of homocysteines are defined as levels between 4 to 10 micromoles per liter. So hyperhomocysteinemia is basically divided into three categories, mild to moderate with levels from 11 to 25, intermediate 26 to 50 micromoles per liter, and severe hyperhomocysteinemia is defined as levels for, of more than 50 micromoles per liter. Now the various causes, like I discussed the basic cycle, physiological cycle, now, it can be genetic defects in mutations in MDHFR gene or the CBS gene, that is cystathionine beta synthase, or nutritional deficiencies of folic acid, vitamin B12, and pyridoxine. Hyperhomocysteinemia not only involves the vascular system, it affects the cardiovascular system, leading to atherosclerosis, can lead to complications in pregnancy, leading to DVTs, sensory organs causing optical dysfunctions, nervous system leading to epilepsies, dementias, skeletal systems leading to osteoporotic fractures. So, why do we need it to study the role of homocysteinemia in venous diseases? As we all know, more than 30, 40 years, there have been many studies that have shown, proven the role of increased level of homocysteines in arterial diseases. But there has been experimental animal models that show that the progression of skin complications in chronic venous diseases and <clears throat> the severity of the primary chronic venous diseases, there is a relationship of increased levels of homocysteine. So the objectives of our study were to assess the homocysteine levels in various stages of primary chronic venous disease and correlate the homocysteine levels in the severity of chronic venous disease. It was a single center observational prospective study of a duration of one year. A total of 200 patients were included in the study and the patients were divided into two groups, the early and the late stage. The early stage included C1 to C3 that had 88 patients and the late stage had 112 patients and included patients from C4 to C6. All the patients were included after the, taking the written informed consent and the institutional ethical committee clearance. The exclusion criteria for the study were patients whose measurement fasting homocysteine levels were not measured, patients with active neoplasm, any acute infections, chronic liver failures, chronic renal failures, previous history of DVT, reformed or active smokers, history of homocysteine urea, patients with vitamin B12 and folate deficiencies, or patients who were on supplementation, pregnant women, and the patients who were not willing for the study. Now coming to the results, the total out of 200 patients, 57 patients, 57 percent patients were females. But not surprisingly, in the late stages, around majority of the patients were males. <clears throat> the coming to this, like I already mentioned, there were 88 patients in the early stage and 112 patients in the late stage. So in the early stage, the homocysteine level more or less were less than 50. They belong to a mild a mild group of the disease. But whereas in patients with the late, late stage, all the patients, 112 patients, had their homocysteine levels above 50. So this was also statistically significantly proven in our study that in the late stages, as the stage progressed, the homocysteine levels increased. And patients who had combination of a C4, A, B, and a C6 disease, their homocysteine levels were statistically significantly positive. Now coming to the discussion, the studies conducted by Krishna et al. and Vaidniki et al. have shown a positive association of hyperhomocysteinemia. And they have shown in their studies 
that it leads to endothelial dysfunction, inflammation, and vascular wall leakage. Homocysteine plays an important role in the escape of fibrinogen that further stresses and justifies the role of white cell trapping theory in the progression of chronic venous disease. In a study by Sam et al., 23% of patients with varicose vein and 65% of patients with ulceration had hyperhomocysteinemia. And similarly, study by Dermazelar et al. also found a statistical significant levels of homocysteine in patients with a C4 and C6 disease. Now coming to conclusion, definitely increased levels of homocysteine may have a significant role in the stages of primary chronic venous disease. And the levels have definitely increased <clears throat> with the severity of the disease. Now, what is the future perspective? Hyperhomocysteinemia, whether it is a cause or it is an implication of a primary chronic venous disease. We all as vascular surgeons need to investigate the role of hyperhomocysteinemia in vascular diseases, especially in primary chronic venous disease. And can vitamin B6 and folate supplementation help in halting the progression of disease <clears throat> or treating the patients and helping in early healing of the ulcers? Further studies are required to assess the relationship of homocysteine in primary chronic venous diseases. These are my references. Thanks for your patient hearing and thanks to the Egyptian Vascular Society for giving me this wonderful opportunity to present my study to the whole world. Thank you so much. Regards from India and Vascular Department Fortis Mohan. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Dr. Love, for a great presentation and for sharing it with us. Let me go to the final contender. His name is Dr. Ayman Ziada. He's a clinical fellow and St. George Hospital, London, UK. Best of luck, Dr. Ayman. Thank you, Dr. Omar. And I'll start sharing okay. my screen. Okay. So good afternoon, dear professors and colleagues. It's a great honor for me uh, to be with you today to present my topic, which is about the use of long brachial sheaths in endovascular treatment of complex aortoiliac lesions. So, let's start with a, a rapid outline for my small presentation. It includes, and uh, sorry about that, includes the conclusion. Uh, so, is a common manifestation of peripheral arterial disease in which strong plaques by sclerotic occlusion and treatment our to iliac arterial segment is where the standard therapy for complex our to iliac lesion based on its long term durability however surgical revascularization is associated with substantial systemic or major comorbidity So endovascular as a minimally invasive alternative for our to iliac occlusive disease with a favorable long-term result. Um, so recanalization by uh, endovascular techniques such as uh, kissing stents technique, preserving flow to post lower limbs. These techniques employ the use of two stents, typically balloon expandable stents placed on, into the aortic bifurcation and uh, simultaneously deployed. It was firstly reported in 1991 and later it became widely used. In case of uh, difficult transfemoral axis, as in iliac chronic total occlusion, utilization of other alternative axis sites such as transradial, transbrachial approach could be used. And in this study, we will discuss is 
to its advantages in the accessibility of the library and in that is the aim of the purpose is to prove the safety and the safety of law uh, or to elite legions. It is favorable uh, to be used in cases of iliac flows, severely calcified uh, common iliac artery ostia or contraindicated contralateral femoral axis. Um, the method for the study. Um, is there a problem with, with, with the presentation? It got disconnected, but reconnected again. Yes, you can continue. Okay, I'm okay, I'm and please, Dr. Love Losra, if you can mute yourself. Thank you very much. You can mute your mic, Dr. Love, from India. Thank you. Go ahead, Dr. Ayman. Uh, I can see the first slide on the show. Yes, you can shift to forward. Uh, I can control it. Um, can I share my screen back again? Yes, yes, we, are, we can see your screen. It is not mine. Okay, so probably is Khalid sharing his presentation. Do you know the slide number that you want to start on? Uh, I think he gave me the sharing screen again. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry, I apologize to everyone about this is some technical issues during presentation. Are you ready to go uh, from this screen, Ayman? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, for is that the one seen by everyone here? Yes, we can see the screen where you mentioned method. Yeah, perfect. So, uh, in this, this study, it was on 21 consecutive patients admitted from uh, March 2017 to uh, December 2018. There were 16 male patients and five ladies, 76% of them were male. Uh, the mean age of them was around 68.4, all ranged between uh, 54 and 80 years. All patients were subjected to clinical assessment, duplex examination, and CT angiogram. Uh, majority of the patients presented with critical limb ischemia. Uh, all of them showed complex uh, aortoiliac lesion, like the ones shown in the images, mostly task P and D and C. Uh, Treatments they were all treated endovascularly in the CAS lab using six French low cheese kissing stents. Uh, we used anti grade brachial axis with the cheese and contralateral retrograde femoral axis as well. Uh, and they uh, had simultaneously uh, to deploy in this cell of water in the common iliac artery in the femoral artery in four patients and in external iliac artery in three patients. On discharge, patients were given dual antiplatelet therapy. Follow-up included the clinical visit and ankle brachial index measurement. So let's uh, go through to the outcome. There were technical success reported in 20 patients. With an increase of ABBI of more than 0.1 in a post in absence of patient out of that 24, uh, 21. Um, so finally, we can uh, get to the conclusion. Actually, our study has to account for several limitations being retrospective in nature, the lack of control group, a limited follow-up period, and the limited sample size. However, it could give a contribution to prove that a long brachial cheese is safe and effective tool during endovascular treatment of complex aortoiliac art, uh, aortoiliac lesion. Um, I finished my presentation, dear. Thank you very much for watching. I'm really appreciating your time and attention. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh, that was great, Dr. Ivan, and thank you for sticking to time. And sorry about the uh, technical issue in the middle of your presentation. And uh, now all our eminent uh, professors and the panelists and judges, if you can forward uh, your marks to uh, the VOT, um, Mr. Khalid, he will collect all your marks for all the six presentations and do the calculation. And our eminent professor Ali Murad will announce the winner out of six live during the presentation. Uh, a few amount of time. So to keep the ball rolling, if you have any comment regarding the panelists to any of the presenter, Please unmute yourself and go ahead. Uh, I have Samer? a question. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, no, no, please, 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 Samer, please, uh, please, Omar. Uh, we don't yeah. want to take comment before uh, voting from the audience. Okay. Voting from audience. Okay. So you want the audience to vote? Okay. Uh, Mr. Khalid, please put uh, the voting. Okay. Uh, read it, uh, Dr. Romer, please. Okay, the vote for the best competitor in your opinion, and it is graded one to six. This is, uh, let us say, publicity vote. It is not the vote that he will be judged upon. Um, and uh, the host and panelists are not allowed to vote. It is only for the 200 roughly attendee and watching on Facebook will be unable to vote. So it's a kind of popularity vote, and it will take about 30 seconds, and then we'll know the winner. But this is the winner out of popularity, not from judges. So we've got, let us say, two winners, one social winner and one true winner. So uh, whenever the uh, slide is ready, uh, Dr. Khalid will announce it, and I think uh, Professor Ayman is collecting the grades to send it to Professor Ali Murad to announce, announce the winner by the judges. <clears throat> Do you like to take uh, Professor Samir's uh, question, Dr. Ayman? Uh, after we know uh, the social winners. Oh, okay. Here is the social winner, 35, 39% is Dr. Nagib Suhail. Number two, by 38%, Dr. Lav Lusra from India. Number three, Dr. El Sanhuri. He is winning 11% of attendee vote. After that, uh, Dr. Dennis Bursk, 7%. After that, Dr. Ayman Ziada, 3%. And lastly, Dr. Chinalev, 1%. This is just the attendee opinion. It is not scientific analysis or opinion, but we thought to put it uh, live in a very fair way. And let us see what the judges will say. Uh, no, please, Omar, you can take uh, comments and whatever okay. you like. Okay, sorry to disturb your uh, question, Professor Samir. If you like to go ahead. Thank you, guys. I really enjoyed the uh, competition. Uh, my question, Dr. Love, about hyperhomocysteinemia. Uh, as we know that, as he mentioned that, we know that vitamin uh, B12 and folic supplement can lower uh, homocysteine. But unfortunately in arterial system and cardiovascular system, nothing, no clinical study showed that giving vitamin D or folic acid will reduce the risk of cardiovascular or, or stroke. So how do you see application of the, all the study if we, it doesn't affect our clinical practice? Uh, yes, sir, I agree with you. A recent paper was published in 2019 that has shown that uh, vitamin D, B, and folate supplementation doesn't improve the 
symptomatic improvement or the outcomes of arterial diseases. So the, our main objective to include hyperhomocysteinemia and start with this study basically was we wanted to see whether we can treat the ulcers that are long standing and very severe forms of disease. Patients who have undergone surgery also who do not have any other factors that has caused the venous disease, the severe form of venous disease. So we wanted to know whether correction of hyperhomocysteinemia by giving these vitamin supplements, can it lead to, uh, can it shorten the course of the disease or can it enhance the healing of the ulcers? So in our second part of the study that we are planning to start very soon, we will be studying the role of folic acid and vitamin B complex and even vitamin D. We will be giving this uh, to a particular group, a control group, and then we will see over a period of six months whether, and we'll be comparing with the patients who are not getting these supplements, whether this is going to help in decreasing the progression of the disease or it is going to help in early recovery from the disease. As of now, we don't have any data whether these supplements can help in decreasing the long duration of the disease, of the, especially the ulcers. But yes, Thank definitely, you. I agree with you. In arterial diseases, it has been proven beyond fact that uh, hyperhomocysteinemia is not an independent risk factor. And secondly, folate supplementation and B-complex supplementation has no role in preventing or treating or shortening the duration of arterial disease, even peripheral vascular as well as the cardiovascular disease. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I'd like, if it's possible, I'd like to ask a question um, for the presenter who presented on the crossectomy. I think that was uh, Kareem, was it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So on the laser crossectomy, the group one was at the junction of the femoral junction, but I noticed there was a DVT in that at the femoral level. Do you think that this should be, although you had good results on lack of reflux, do you think that the risk of DVT makes this a too risky a procedure to do and we should still be treating the anterior accessory sphenous vein directly? What is this? was not my presentation. I think it was... Uh, excuse me, yeah. I, I think this is mine, Professor yes. Omar. It was, yes, it was uh, Dr. Suhail, yes, uh, crossectomy at level zero. If you would like to reply to Professor Whitley. Yes, it's, it's, it's a great honor for me to, to, reply, to reply you, uh, Professor Whitley. Uh, of course, you have a point. Uh, I think for uh, having more uh, patients and uh, more, uh, more uh, huge number of uh, patients, we could... Uh, tell if it's safe enough or not, but uh, having only one patient of uh, the 20 group A, I think it's, it's not that worse uh, and could be accepted, especially that we have uh, superficial thrombophlebitis, only one patient in each group, so almost comparable uh, ratio. But of course you have a point, we should have uh, more patients to get uh, a significant P value or not, to say, is it safe? enough or not. Okay, thank you very much. Actually, the, the grades are extremely interesting and totally different from voting. Uh, it is really surprising. So, Professor Ali Murad, he now has by the panelists from the five continents in the world and he is our trustee in vascular surgery. If you like to announce the winner, Professor Ali Murad. Okay. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We are all here today in celebration of uh, Dr. Adi Hami legacy. I would like to thank the organizers for appointing me as the director of the competition. This means a lot to me to be associated with Dr. Adi Hami Price. You will know how much the relation was between me and him. I would like also to thank the referees for their time and inputs. Such, such a selection of international talents and ex expertise. Although we are all not used to these virtual events yet, but it is great that we can now have such experts joining us. 
Also, I have to thank the competitors as well. You should be proud to be here today. Uh, selecting you to compete today already means that you have done exceptional work that has an impact on the field of vascular surgery. Selecting the best presentation was not an easy task for our referees. To all the competitors and the young talents attending with us, I have a message for you. You are the future of the vascular surgery. We were, we were coached and monitored by the best like Dr. Adi Elhami. And this has a profound impact on our performance and the progress we were able to achieve. Our generation's achievement were always one of Dr. Adil's biggest sources of pride and happiness. God knows we are doing our best to coach and monitor your generation, and we are always proud and happy for your accomplishments and progress. Please do your best to keep achieving, and most importantly, to play the same role for the upcoming generations so the field of Egyptian vascular, vascular surgery can be continued. An important recognition for Dr. Ayman Fakhri. For Dr. Ayman Fakhri. This event from concept to execution is all his idea and effort. I am not thanking only him for today's event and his incredible achievement in turning the competition into an international one where our young surgeons can be exposed to international expertise like we have today. I'm thanking him for the beautiful ideas of this competition and for seven years of effort and the tuning and, the tu and the turning it into a tradition that many look forward to. Now, all of you are waiting for the winner. The Bryce won two. The Bryce won two. Dr. Brosek Dennis from Russia. Dr. Brosek Dennis from Russia. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. Do you like to say a word, Dennis? You, you got. 3% of the votes of attendees. So, and you are the winner from this. You can see the difference. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, so, um, so, thank you, dear colleagues, for this opportunity. Uh, I'm really excited to win a prize. Um, so, and I really appreciate for all of you and uh, so you know our randomized study was uh, three years we did it for three years so and I uh, really uh, so it's a very good emotion that you know when we have some prize so as a result also and uh, so what can I say more champagne for everybody <laughs> okay. well, it is not allowed in my country but anyway thank you very much Dennis and thank you everyone for sharing with us. And the mic is back to Professor Ayman Fakhri. Congratulations, Dennis. Uh, really, you did a very nice job and a very nice work. Thank you. Have you to open your camera, Ayman. Uh, sorry, sorry. Sorry. Uh, I, thank you, Dennis. You did a very good job. Job and congratulations. Yeah, you deserved it. Uh, yeah. uh, it was a very nice piece of work. Good luck, and I hope uh, to keep your position for the next year. If you are still uh, below 40. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay, I think uh, I have to say congratulations to all competitors. We had 22 competitors from all the universe. Uh, I promise to send all of them appreciation. Uh, and we have uh, six final competitors uh, today. They all did well. 
uh, and uh, as we promised, we'll give uh, the, uh, the winner today the prize of uh, Dr. Adil Ilham uh, International Award. It will be free uh, registration and accommodation for our next conference, AGVASC, uh, in December 10th to, 12, uh, to 13th, 2020. Welcome, Dennis, and uh, you'll get free registration and accommodation. You will get uh, the appreciation award and the golden medal for uh, Adel Elham Prize, uh, and you will give uh, the social winner to the prize uh, from uh, Egyptian v Venus Forum. It is an Oscar for best achievement, uh, public best achievement. Uh, congratulations, Dr. Suhaib. Uh, finally, I would like to thank all uh, panels. I would like to thank the Great Scientific Committee. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, uh, Antigani. Thank you, uh, Raul. Thank you, Tare. Thank you for your effort. And I would like to thank the great uh, panel today. Thank you, Dr. Mon uh, Professor Munir Nazal. Thank you, Professor uh, Antoniani. Thank, thank you, Professor Ahmed Buzgart. Thank you, Professor Mark Whitley. Thank you, Professor Samir Kosair and uh, Professor Martin Marsh. And uh, dear Professor Ali Murad for directing uh, the competition. And of course, thank you, Omar, for uh, co-chairing uh, the the winner today. I would like to thank El Ahleya Company for sponsoring this uh, webinar and competition. Thank you, uh, dear colleagues in Ahleya. Thank you, Dr. Uh, and Mr. Khalid Zidan uh, from Prime Partner. Thank you for your effort. Before I go, I would like to invite you all next Friday on the first uh, AG VASC virtual conference. We'll see you all next Friday and Saturday. You will meet your avatar. Please be ready and we'll see you next uh, Friday. Happy to meet you and great honor to be with you always. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.